Very warm welcome to all the delegates who have joined us this evening. Um, I think we are having a lot of uh, webinars and uh, recess immunize, aloe immunization seems to be an extremely popular topic. But when I was going through the statics, statistics, I was quite surprised to find that we haven't really done enough for our pregnant women, our recess negative women as yet. Um, I thank you all of you on behalf of the Association of Tamil Nadu members of the RCOG, the faculty who have joined us. I'm very happy to have with us Dr. Vikas Hekde, Dr. Umaram, Dr. Suman Nadrajan, Dr. Seshad, uh, Sudarshan Suresh, and Dr. Chandra Kumar. When I said I was surprised, I was quite, this is a 2019 publication which says, we still have severe morbidity and death because of recess disease and reduced only by approximately 50% globally during the last 50 years. So what have we been doing all these years? NTD, immunoglobulin prophylaxis, you are talking of more than 160,000 perinatal deaths and 100,000 disabilities annually. So really can we justify this? Are we doing the right thing for our women? Uh, Ma'am, ma uh, we are unable to see your screen, ma'am. Could you just share the screen, please? Is it not? You're not able to see it? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, yes, yes, we can see your screen, ma'am. So I'll just start from the beginning. It won't take yeah. long. Yeah, sure. Uh, but you were able to hear me, right? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. We can see you, and we can see your slide as well, ma'am. Right. Okay. So whenever we think of uh, rhesus uh, disease, we, two names come up to our mind: Queen Anne and Lily. You can see that even I remember as a postgraduate having these three zones, trying to put women into one of these three zones, trying to measure you know, the uh, optical density, etc. Uh, we have done this ourselves when we were postgraduates, looking for the titer. So these are two names. I just thought, let me refresh everybody with a little bit of... Um, uh, you should go to slideshow. Let's look at uh, Albert William Lyley. He's from New Zealand, Auckland. And he's famous for his uh, techniques of life-saving in utero blood transfusions for fetuses. And we're talking of some years ago, not the current technology that we have. But apart from this, he was not just a passionate clinician, but also a researcher. And he was one of the early ones to talk about the rights of the fetuses. And rights of an RH compromised fetus is something that we are probably going to be discussing today. Now, prior to World War II, when an RH negative woman produced antibodies in response to the incompatible, uh, incompatibility, she carried these antibodies for life. There was absolutely no way of neutralizing them. Later pregnancies, when she came back, we all know the risk that they have undergone. Now, Lily actually started his research in the early 1960s. Most important, he became proficient in the technique of amniocentesis. But amniocentesis those days was quite a circus. Now, what actually happened was a geneticist who was visiting the National Women's Hospital in early 1960s uh, she and told Lily and her team that when you put normal blood cells into the abdomen or the peritoneal cavity of neonates and infants who had this hemolytic disease or a disease of blood, the neonates rapidly absorb these cells in large quantities. And this was a very, very important finding. So repeated uh, tests of the amniotic fluid indicated whether the condition was stationary or whether anemia was worsening. And this is how they monitored the women and took them up to a point when they could induce labor. And remember, neonatology was really not that well developed at that time either. He also developed a chart of changing amniotic fluid bilirubin levels. And that was the only way they could assess the severity of compromise in the fetus, the delta optical density at 450. This was actually uh, measured along with the gestational period and they were put into three zones trying to pick up which fetus needed immediate care. So in 1963, he aided this woman, uh, Mrs. McLeod, with her fetus and what they found out was success of transfusion treatment 
in the first few years was only 39%. But we have to look at it this way. It was 39%. Now look at the circus that they went through. Needle penetration of the uterus was a very precarious procedure. Today we have ultrasound to guide us. Even under x-ray guidance or even with palpation, the best of the clinical hands that you could get, the needle could actually penetrate into the baby. It could The fetal peritoneal cavity, the risk of puncturing the fetus's body, any of the body parts, or even rupturing the amniotic sac. Now, all this could cause sufficient damage to the fetus. So it's very, very important that under all these adverse conditions, they actually forged ahead and probably laid the foundation for what we are able to offer today. He also formed the Society for Protection of the Unborn Child in 1970. The other pioneer with regard to RH disease is John Queenan from the USA. Those days, fetal medicine was very rudimentary. No laboratory models were there for RH disease. No ultrasound was the most important thing. Rapid advancement from a time when we were evaluating RH immunized mothers only with what we had in our hands, history, physical examination, at the most, the measurement of an RH antibody titer. They moved on to performing amniocentesis under the most adverse conditions, looking for the estimating the bilirubin levels, amniography, and then they slowly moved on to intrauterine transfusions as they were known those days. And he says, in the 1960s, when I was a resident at New York Hospital, I became fascinated by the fact that RH immunized mothers faced a 50% chance of losing a totally normal baby because it was uh, exposed to a hostile environment. At that time, RH alloimmunization accounted for approximately 6,000 perinatal deaths in the United States. We have moved on from the Klyhauer betke test, the estimation of the bilirubin in amniotic fluid using the optical density, evaluating the tube method for the antibody titers. We got ultrasound to give us a lot of information about the baby. And then Doppler or Doppler flow studies have more or less taken up the upper hand in the management of research disease. So thank you all very much with this brief introduction. Please post your questions in the chat box and we will take it at the end of the session. I would like to now move on to introduce Dr. Vikas. Can we please have his slide? Dr. Vikas is a consultant in charge transfusion medicine at the Apollo Speciality Hospitals in Chennai. He's a diplomat of the National Boards for Transfusion Medicine, postdoctoral certificate in immunohematology, certificate in cell therapy. He has three national and international organizations. He's a member of the three. He has an experience of almost 10 years, and he has previously worked at the Indraprastha Polo Hospitals, the BL Kapoor Super Speciality Hospitals, Sanjay Gandhi, Lucknow, the ILBS New Delhi, and the BGS Global Hospitals in Bengaluru. Um, Dr. Vikas today will be speaking to us about blood groups, compatibility and incompatibility. Now, why did we choose this topic? Because we know time and again that we have done the ABO group, we know the research status, but still, we do get some problems. We get reactions when we have given a blood transfusion. Even managing a mother or a neonate, we know that there is much more to it than just the simple A, B, O, A, B, etc. So, and these irregular antibodies that we all need to be testing, I think some centers have started testing, and I think we do at the Apollo hospitals, uh, we have started. So Dr. Vikas is going to elaborate on all this for us. Welcome, Dr. Vikas. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Yes, Dr. Vikas, we can hear you and we can see your screen. See you, uh, see my slide. Th thanks, ma'am. Thanks for your introduction and thank you for inviting me. And uh, thanks the um, 
Association of Tamil Nadu RCOG group for inviting me and providing me an opportunity to speak on blood groups compatibility and incompatibility so if i see it as a topic it covers almost uh, one third of the syllabus of transfusion medicine so putting the whole thing into 24 slide i have done uh, uh, enough work so that um, you will take home a good message from this topic so uh, i am going to talk on the following things that is the blood group systems um, and the emphasis will be on the abo blood groups and i will touch upon the other blood group systems that is rh kel duffy kid mns systems i will talk on the antibodies allo and auto antibodies type uh, type and screen policy and cross matches complications of uh, Uh, wrong blood transfusion and lastly the legalities the take home message will be answering two questions at the last of the uh, session what is wrong blood transfusion and what are the legal liabilities because when i um, uh, i face a lot of questions from the clinical side regarding uh, whether we can transfuse the blood across the blood groups Uh, what what is wrong blood transfusion and what are our legal liabilities so this is one of the important thing i will touch upon and and this session so first of all the red cells antigens are located on the surface of the red cells they are mainly carbohydrate and proteins and their expression is determined by the genes so if we look at the red cell antigen systems there are around 36 blood group system encompassing 346 antigens your own uh, dear friend rh blood group system has around 49 blood group antigens so this is the enormity of the antigen systems in on the red blood cells and um, uh, it will be very difficult to find out an antibody against one of these so fortunately we have two things to in our favor that is one is hardy weinberg law which states states that the frequency of antigens will be stable in a population which is undisturbed so we know suppose in a in a uh, group of individuals that suppose in a state of tamil nadu we know how much are a positive individuals how much are b positive individuals and o positive ab positive individuals and their frequencies so this is one good thing second thing is the antibodies are formed and found against the low frequency antigen so that the transfusion becomes not that difficult now the coming to the red cell antibodies there are two classes mainly uh, igm and igg type of antibodies and in red cell immunohematology we classify them as allo antibodies which are directed against foreign antigens and auto antibodies which are directed against individuals own red cells coming to the abo blood group systems it was discovered by carl landsteiner which ushered a new era of transfusion medicine in 19000 ad and 1980 and he got nobel prize in 1938 for the same thing still it is one of the most important blood group systems it has three main antigen types that is a b and ab four blood groups are based on these antigen expressions that is a b ab and o we all know this so the expression of these antigens begins at 5 to 6 week of gestation and fully expressed by 2 to 4 years of age so this uh, helps us a lot in determining this age um, uh, determining age dependent discrepancy of blood groups and also this abo blood system is expressed on body fluids platelets various endothelial and epithelial tissues so this idea is for the transplant immunology purpose that is whenever we take upon the transplant the first barrier we have to break is that of the apo blood group system so 
what is land tenure law this is a very simple law but it has a tremendous application in the field of transfusion medicine it it is just simple law it states that if an antigen is abo antigen is present over rbcs so the corresponding antibody will be absent or vice versa if the antigen is absent on rbcs the corresponding antibody will be present in plasma it means to say suppose there is um, the blood group is a the uh, antibody present in the individual is anti b and not anti a so this is very simple but the application becomes tremendous when we think of uh, giving across the blood um, transfusion ac across the blood group transfusion these abo antibodies have uh, a significance for the reason that they are universally present and they are almost regularly present means to say almost all always present in an individual and they are therefore called as expected so it is um, uh, peculiar peculiar to find if they are not absent they are called as unexpected presence so the antibody systems are classified as expected antibodies and unexpected antibodies abo system is a group of expected antibodies so they are naturally occurring antibodies they are detectable by 3 to 6 months of age and reaches an adult titer by age of 5 to 10 years so uh, it it becomes significant when we take um, the infants blood group for uh, antibody identification or uh, blood grouping so till the age of 3 to 6 months we have to depend only upon the forward typing that is on the antigens only and not of the antibodies so the antibodies are igm type of antibodies and they have an optimal temperature of 37 degrees celsius and they are potent hemolysins that is they are capable of causing activating the complement cascade and causing acute intravascular hemolysis and even death in some cases so um, let me explain this slide it is very simple that for um, to call a blood group as a uh, blood group the uh, it has um, to have antigen a on its surface and anti b antibody in its serum similarly for b b antigen on surface and anti a antibody on in the serum for ab anti ab ant antibody and no ant antigen and no antibodies in the serum and to call blood group as o it has to be it has it should not have any anti a it should not have any antigen on its surface either a or b and it should have both type of antibodies that is anti a and antibody anti b antibody in the serum so the importance of blood groups lies in abo blood group lies in transfusion Uh, some cases of hdfn organ transplantation and stem cell transplantation in the organ transplantation as i said earlier the uh, abo barrier the antibody barrier has to be breached in order to make a graft sur survive in an individual so similarly is the case of the stem cell so now coming to the topic of cross match and across the group transfusion it is very important so let me uh, tell uh, the audience that the cross match is of two types one is the major cross match where we match the red cells of the donor that is the red cells which are already present in our stock with the serum of the patient this is called as a major cross match where the red cells have to be compatible and it should not give any reaction similarly there is a minor cross match this comes into play when we uh, start the transfusion of platelets or plasma products like ffp so here the plasma products should uh, be compatible with the cells of the recipient this is called as a minor cross match so in the absence of um, uh, 
particular um, uh, in the absence of a component suppose um, the patient is requires a, a positive and suppose we don't have the a positive blood group in stock which is very much pertinent in this situation of covid where the footfall of the donors have become very less in the blood bank so in these cases we try giving across the group, group components that is we don't give the blood group which is exactly identical suppose a person is a positive we will give a blood which is compatible with his serum that is o positive so similarly this across the group transfusion has become now a o in my setup i will at least transfuse one across the group transfusion one patient will be given across the group transfusion in a week and for plasma product it is almost a daily job so the across the group transfusion has become a o these days because of the donor lesson donor football so when i say about across the group transfusion this slide plays an important role here so that uh, the whole blood suppose we give a whole blood to the individual so it must be identical it's for the reason that it contains both the plasma as well as the red cells and the plasma may react with the uh, recipient cells so the whole blood whenever we take a whole blood it has to be identical and specific that is a should be given a only but when it compound uh, comes to the component therapy the packed red cells or granulocytes they must be compatible with the patient serum so that you can give across the group transfusion also for plasma as i said earlier it has to be compatible and for platelets these uh, need not be compatible or identical because the amount of plasma in the platelets is very less it's just around 40 to 60 ml so considering that so across the group transfusion can be done easily in the platelets similarly in the cryoprecipitate so these are the components and this is a glimpse on what can be transfused to what individual suppose prvc transfusion is considered across the abo group so a patient of blood group a can be given either a or o prvcs for a patient with b b or o o only o has to be given since it it has no um, anti it has both type of antibodies and it will be incompatible with all the other blood groups so it is a universal donor but not it is a specific recipient similarly for ab either a ab or o can be given to these individuals they are universal recipients pertaining to the prprvc transfusion but if we come to the plasma and plasma product transfusion a patient with blood group a can be transfused with a or ab so the, in the previous slide we saw that the for prvc transfusion a can be transfused with a and o but here it becomes bit reversed so that ab becomes a universal donor in case of plasma products because ab does not have any antibodies in it and all recipient cells match with the ab plasma so a can be given with a and ab p can be given transfused with a or ab plasma o can be transfused with all the a ab a and b so it becomes a universal recipient here whereas ab becomes only a specific donor because it it's compatible with only ab so this is a bit about the abo blood group system and whether we can transfuse it across the group and what type of components can be transfused now coming to the unexpected red cell antibody the abo antibodies are expected so they are regular but there are other red cell systems the rest 35 red blood systems of the 36 which are unexpected so they are not naturally occurring they are they occur only when a stimulus is present so these 
are apart from all abo antibodies they are also called irregular antibodies there are two major type of antibody systems in this one is auto antibody which can be against a high frequency uh, antigen present on the red cell and it may be non specific but allo antibodies are always specific and they are uh, they react against one particular antigen so they are Uh, they may be against the rh kel kid duffy mns blood group systems so these are called as unexpected and irregular antibodies so they can originate uh, either naturally suppose ntm and ntn can be naturally found in an um, individual uh, similar to abo antibodies but they are irregular means in all individuals they are not present for um, they they may be passively acquired due to the immunoglobulin transfusion ivigs rhig products which we give to the uh, patients they may be transfused passively or they may be trans they may be present in the plasma due to a particular situation where the passenger lymphocyte syndrome that is the transplanted organ may carry a plasma cell which generates the antibodies in this so transplant um, transplant medicine has opened an opened a new uh, arena of this passive antibodies found in the patients earlier it was not so now allo immunization the three particular events are considered to be the major allo immunizing events in an individual one is pregnancy second is the bone marrow transplantation third is the uh, first is pregnancy second is transfusion and third is bone marrow transfusion transplantation these are the three major events these comes in the history taking part of uh, evaluating an antibody either of the three in, uh, events should have occurred for the immunization and third is the autoimmunity which may be due to viral infection or malignancy such as lymphoma or drugs like methylidoma so how to detect this unexpected antibody in the patient's blood so it has to be detected the significance is we have to know uh, prior hand as to which uh, which patient needs a thorough work up and which patients we can support and also we should be able to tell which patients we cannot support suppose there is a bombay blood group and the frequency of getting a blood bombay blood group is just 1% so in that case blood group i am sure that 90 99% of the blood banks in any state will not be able to support these patients and we have to tell the clinician regarding the possibility of getting the blood in case he is posted for a surgery and in that case we have to um, predict the time suppose we have had a patient 6 months back which who was posted for transplantation had a bombay blood group uh, we got to know upon work up so we had to tell that defer the transplant for 4 months so that uh, within that span we could arrange for a bombay blood group but fortunately we could do it in just one month so this is the um, this is the um, necessity of doing the prior anti antibody identification for this purpose we uh, do a particular test uh, which is the test or a policy which is called as type and screen policy in this at the first visit of the hospital the patient is typed for the blood group usually we do um, abo and rh rh means d abo d for blood group and in some circumstances we will go ahead to type other antigens such as c and c e kel and sometimes duffy and other antigens the second important test is screening screening means we identify the antibodies using a panel of o cells which can detect the unexpected antibodies either allo antibody or auto antibody present in the blood of an individual so uh, with finding these antibodies we can proceed ahead with the immunohematology work up so that we can determine the properties of the antibody exactly and 
provide a specific blood to the patient this is the importance of type and screen policy in a patient and at the first uh, we insist of doing it at the first visit to the hospital this is the importance of antibody screening that is to detect the patient early early and be prepared for the availability of blood Second is identification of rare blood types such as Bombay phenotype, and um, then administration of anti D. So suppose a patient has been administered an anti D um, uh, prophylaxis, and we can just say by looking at the panel itself that whether it is um, anti D administered or some other underlying antibody is present in the patient just by a, seeing a screening panel. so this is the most most important aspect of transfusion medicine and it is now advised in almost all uh, tertiary care setups so when do you call an antibody a clinical clinically significant antibody this is usually when the red cell antibody causes hdfn or hemolytic transfusion reaction or a notable decrease in the red cell survival or it causes a transplant rejection so these are the times when we call an antibody as a clinically significant antibody so the antibody specificity and the igg class the thermal range of the antibody reaction concentration the titration of the antibody all these are needed to sum up the clinical significance of the antibody in the laboratory so are all antibodies um, dangerous or all antibodies create the problem the answer is no only few antibodies causes acute hemolytic reaction that is intravascular hemolysis they are abo type of antibodies kid diago p among the rh small c and capital c antigen these are the antigens which we have to be very careful that these uh, antigens uh, may cause acute hemolytic reaction similarly there are anti there there are antibodies which causes a delayed type of hemolytic reaction that is the antibodies may uh, attach to the red cell and the extravascular culling of the red cell takes place in the spleen so such antibodies in an emergent situation these blood, this blood can be given so that we know that the patient has hemolysis maybe after 24 hours or up to 7 days but the blood can be transfused so this is also important the um, of identifying which type of antibody is present suppose rhd e small e kid duffy and ns systems are present then we can safely say that they are delayed type of hemolytic reactions similarly there are certain reactions which are only serological type of they are called as del delayed serological transfusion reactions so with these antibodies suppose levis antibody is present in a blood we can just transfuse the blood without any harm to the patient so this is the importance of identifying a clinically significant antibody so there are few and this is a list of very short list of antibodies that is rh antibodies d and small c they cause severe hfdn and severe hemolytic transfusion reaction similarly e capital c and small e can cause hemolytic reaction of newborn and um, they cause hemolytic reaction to a lesser extent kel causes anti kel antibody causes severe hemolytic um, transfusion reaction as well as hfdn here the importance of kid antibody is it rarely causes hfdn but it causes hemolytic transfusion reaction similarly uh, there are mns system ssu antibodies which causes severe hdfn as well as severe hemolytic reaction so m and and m antibody rarely causes hemolytic reaction but yes if present they can cause hemolytic reaction and it is reactive at 37 degrees celsius n and anti n antibody causes mild uh, hfdn and and hemolytic transfusion reaction so this is these are certain some some antibodies of that 35 uh, 
anti um, gen systems which can cause um, a big headache to the clinician so identification of these antibodies at an early stage and screening during the antenatal screening helps in uh, determining the outcome of the um, uh, antibodies presence dr vikas so now coming to yes hello you got two more minutes sir yeah 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 this is a last but one slide this is one bombay phenotype which is identified rarely and uh, you can see that the frequency of the antigen is just below 1 so um, so the provision of this uh, anti uh, blood with bombay phenotype becomes very difficult in a clinical scenario for it is like avo antibodies it causes severe type of hemolytic reaction lastly the legalities of wrong blood group transfusion is there a criminal liability the answer is no that is a um, clinician or a blood banker being arrested for uh, transfusing a wrong blood group no the there is there was a case of dr ajana agnihotri versus state of haryana in supreme court of india it was just in february 2020 where everything was wrong one is the blood group was not checked it was directly transfused from the donor without cross match it was collected in a nursing home with not a blood bank and it was transfused directly to the patient and the patient died having done all the wrong things still the court said that the doctor was crimin not criminally liable for he tried to save the life so is there civil liability yes there is law of tort which st states that wrong blood transfusion is a medical negligence and fine up till now was just 5 lakh rupees whereas the tti that is transfusion trans suppose a individual got hiv from wrong blood transfusion the fine goes up to 25 lakhs now the civil liability is just 5 lakhs and it was by a premier premier institute that is pgi chandigarh where the one um, indiv individual lady was uh, transfused of repeatedly transfused of wrong blood group and she died ultimately the liability who is liable the answer is the institute is liable because neither in that case neither the clinician could be held responsible for the blood bank provided a wrong blood and the blood bank particularly could not be held responsible because it show it was able to show that the wrong sample was sent to the blood bank for cross match so these are the things where we can say that the liability usually lies on the institute and the last question whether to whether across the blood group transfusion attracts some legal questions suppose we transfuse a to ab or uh, o to a does it cause any harm so in case some damage occurs to the patient unrelated also so the answer is there is no such liability because already that has come in the guidelines of national blood transfusion council standards of blood bank 2007 and also the dghs transfusion manual so the take home message is simple so the blood can be transfused across the blood groups thanks sir thank you very much uh, dr vikas for taking us through this uh, spectrum in fact uh, recently a, a classmate of mine daughter Uh, in fact our uh, colleague at apollo speciality dr chakalingam's daughter was diagnosed with a bombay blood group in the us and uh, they panicked so they were asked for to go in for autologous uh, transfusion yes, yes. um you know we read about this earlier and i had to read up before reassuring him actually uh, thank you very much we will take questions at the end so we will uh, now move on to the panel which um, i will be sharing Okay, so this is management of Rh negative women in pregnancy. Uh, 
I have with me Dr. Umar Ram, Dr. Suman Adrajan, and Dr. Sudarshan to take me through. Uh, uh, Session, are you going to project their slides or? Yes, ma'am, I can. You want me to stop sharing for a minute? Yes. So, uh, welcome Dr. Suman Adrajan, a very close friend, a passionate obstetrician. I'm not going to read everything that's written there because all of us know that she is an achiever. Uh, she is practicing obstetrics, if I may say, at the Ganga Women and Children Hospital at Ramnagar in Coimbatore. She's also the managing director of SJ Craft Fertility Center, along with her daughter, with whom I share the name. She is Director of In-House Medicare, again at Ramnagar, Coimbatore. She has a lot of publications and presentations to her credit. Um, she is the President of the Coimbatore Obstetric and Gynecological Society from 2004 to 6, and again in 2010 and 13 to 14. Secretary of Coimbatore OG Society from 1993 to 1994. Uma is, uh, sorry, Suma is known for the uh, labor conferences, which she conducts every alternate year. And we as faculty look forward to going for these conferences. And I know a lot of delegates do as well. Welcome, Suma. Can I have Dr. Uma? Uma, again, to introduce a very, very close friend. Again, a passionate obstetrician, chairperson of the Southern Zone of the All India Coordinating Committee of the RCOG, examiner for the Part 3 MRCOG, Coordinator Part 2 and 3 MRCOG course in Chennai 2003-18. She's contributed again many chapters and publications. Um, someone who combines clinical medicine with academics very beautifully. She was given the Young Gynecologist Award in 2007 by the AOFOG and the International Diabetic Federation Blue Ring Women Achiever Award and the Rotary International 2015. Her main areas of interest are fetal growth, multiple pregnancy, fetoscopy, GDM, and health awareness in women, music, travel, reading, and I think more recently, tennis gardening is something that she has added on to her hobbies. Dr. Sudarshan, welcome, Uma. Dr. Sudarshan is a young fetal medicine specialist. Um, he may not like it if I introduce him as Dr. Suresh Sun, but that's how I think we have known him. But Sudarshan has his own identity as a fetal medicine specialist. And most of us now have actually stopped calling Dr. Suresh when we have a problem. It's Sudarshan for us at the other end of the phone. Thank you very much, Sudarshan. Um, all the very best in the future for you. Thank you for joining us. Can we stop sh screen sharing, please? Let's do it. <clears throat> Right. So, um, Suma and Uma, uh, do you think there's been a change in the presentation of the RH, uh, you know, ISO immunization in the, over the years? I think both of you have at least, Suma has I mean, between 20 and 30 years of experience in the field. And do you think the presentation has changed over the years? Uh, yes. Uh, the, we used to see worse conditions in the past and then the, the, definitely there is a good change the perinatal mortality and morbidity has uh, come down and uh, treatment is much better and the identification of uh, problems are much better. And uh, the worst scenario, I don't think I've seen any worst scenario of late, except that I have just one patient now who has been uh, iso immunized and she has got a titer of 1 in 32 and then, uh, but everything is going on well with her. So that is a change, definitely. Omar, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think uh, there is a, a positive change. 
uh, in our urban practices we really don't see that much of a problem i think i get to see the other end of the spectrum because of the association with mediscan and they do still get a lot of referrals for fairly significant rh disease and fetuses which are quite hydro hydropic and you know nearly ready to go mm. um so it is unfortunate that uh, that side of the spectrum still exists uh, but thankfully in our personal practices we don't see such bad disease yeah so it is important i think it's something we can't ignore we we need to still keep our finger on the button and try to improve what we are doing and basically i think create awareness because uh, managing these women has come a long way so we need to uh, think i'm probably going to slip skip this slide and uh, not not too sure whether i have my old presentation here you think can can you all give me just 2 minutes please can you stop sharing this for me i'll just come back with my old uh, new one thank you i have a problem with my screen share i don't know one minute just give me 2 minutes i'm extremely sorry can you just stop sharing the screen for me please can the organizers do it your your screen is no longer shared jayshri there is nothing happening okay. So Darshan, while she's setting it up, do you want to just say, um, you know, because as I said, you see the other end of the spectrum. Over the years, do you think that the incidence of uh, significant rhesus disease is coming down? And what is the profile of patients where you are still seeing significant disease? Okay, uh, see the the number of uh, pregnancies where we end up doing uh, intrauterine and fetal transfusion. Uh, has not reduced i am still doing significant number of transfusions uh, every year uh, but uh, majority of them as you have said uh, are referrals which come from across the state and up from the neighboring states also uh, and invariably quite a chunk of them are those which have been uh, probably not managed in the most optimal manner considering the fact that uh, i am still seeing quite a number of uh, severely hydropic babies for transfusion uh, doing a transfusion is okay you can still have an isoimmune status that is affected but uh, having an isoimmune status that is affected and already severely hydropic at the time of treatment is something that can be definitely avoided if the monitoring has been there yes antd has reduced the number of uh, isoimmunizations but uh, the potential need for uh, proper monitoring in the isoimmunized pregnancies and standardization of the icd test has still not uh, as uh, acceptable as it should be i would say so uh, i guess as we go through the panel we will realize what the sequence of flow for monitoring uh, such a woman who can have an isoimmunized pregnancy is going to be and uh, the challenges in the periphery with regard to the availability of both the antibody test and the expertise to monitor these babies with the doppler which we all kind of take for granted is probably what results in these babies coming back to you uh, referred in a late stage yeah so if you want me to also put across the worst case scenario scene so uh, a couple of uh, 3 4 months back i think before the lockdown started we had a, a a doctor who had come and she also happened to be a, an imaging person and she came with an isoimmunized pregnancy known well known to be isoimmunized but due to uh, improper monitoring by the time she landed up here for transfusion uh, the baby was not uh, very severely hydropic baby had some effusion but the baby already had an intraventricular hemorrhage so the anemia had resulted in uh, thrombocytopenia also resulting in fetal cranial hemorrhage where we were not able to even offer any treatment because despite the treatment the outcome would have been bad so uh, this was a very is 2020 yeah. in a physician this is 2020 in a physician and an and a person was actually doing imaging she on that with on that depressing note we will hand over back to dr jayshree gajraj to take it forward 
Thank you, thank you, Ma. I think uh, there's some mix up my. I had another presentation which is gone because I had a beautiful picture of the Reese's monkey there for all of us. But anyway, we can still go ahead with this. So let's start off with this 25 year old girl. She comes with her husband. She's been negative planning conception. So how will you counsel her? I know it sounds terribly simple, but Uma or Suma, how would you take her forward? Now, 24 year old girl, uh, she is RH negative. So we need to do the uh, blood grouping of the husband, whether he is negative or positive. And then once you know that if he is negative, then the problem is not much. But if he is uh, positive, then we need to go ahead with the, uh, we need to tell her, uh, we need to see the, um, I mean, uh, well, once she is, uh, he is positive and she is negative, we need to do certain, uh, we need to tell her to go on with the pregnancy. But uh, have to take a detailed history with regard to prior uh, blood transfusions for any other reason or uh, dead, dead transfusion because of uh, dengue fever or any other. Take a detailed history. And then if she is, uh, she has, uh, and in fact, uh, I don't know whether ICT need to be done at this stage because sometimes the titers are also positive. And uh, with that, I think she can plan her con conception with the folic acid, uh, starting folic acid. So, Umar, did you need to do her ICT? Is it too much of a... Um, I mean, uh, well... The one information that I would like to get, which is not on your slide, is to know whether she's had a prior pregnancy or not. If she's had, if this is her first pregnancy, that I know first time she's coming for a pre-pregnancy checkup and has not had any pregnancy, miscarriage or live birth earlier, then yes, I would be fairly reassuring, give her the routine advice and as Suma said, check the husband's blood group and type. But yeah. So I think the point to bring out here is that preconception visit to the obstetrician is very, very important. And maybe even we proactively can uh, sort of try and look into this before they get married or before they conceive. Any That's history not. of blood transfusion also would be kind of uh, uh, yeah. uh, required, right? Yeah, I think Suma mentioned that. Yeah. So Suma and Uma, both of them had mentioned that. So we we'll, let's move on to this 27 year old uh, primary para. She's B negative. Husband is B positive. She's just missed her period. Urine pregnancy test positive. She's seeing you for the booking visit. Extremely worried, of course, because you know they've done a lot of search, etc. So uh, what will you advise her now? She's just missed her period, and how will you counsel or reassure her? It's not the same couple. It's different. You've not seen them earlier. Yeah. No, if she's a primary gravida, I don't think you have mentioned again whether she's primary or not. Primary, I've said primary, yeah. Yeah, okay. If she's a primary gravida, you just have to reassure us that uh, RH negative and RH positive is not a big uh, problem. So you need to do all the routine tests that you do. You have to manage them like any other non pregnant, uh, any other uh, routine pregnant uh, woman with the RH positive blood grouping. And uh, except that, you need to uh, add on ICT in uh, the indirect Coombs test and the first visit. And then reassure if that is negative, reassure that everything is going on fine. And then some people believe in doing monthly ICT, but I personally, in my practice, I do it at 28 weeks of uh, pregnant, uh, pregnancy again, ICT, and then follow it up carefully with the routine antenatal examinations. The routine iron and calcium need to be given. So, uh, much. What is the advice regarding the ICT? Uh, would, would you do it at booking and then if it's negative, when will you repeat it? Um, usually in a primary, if she has not had any other history, uh, we reconfirm the blood group. Um, I don't always get an ICT at booking, but it, we can, uh, I mean, it, it's probably good practice to get it. Subsequently, I get it uh, at the time when they come back at 24 weeks, al 24 to 26 weeks along with their sugars and CBC, because in between we are going to do a scan and we are going to get the uh, uh, Dopplers done in any case. So uh, I don't do a monthly ICT. <clears throat> so Darshan, would you want them to do a, a booking um, ICT? Do you think that would help you if, they, if when we come to you later on with it? Situate problem. So, so we don't compare from the initial to the later ICT. The only thing is getting a proper history 
uh, again uh, i can keep putting in some worst case scenarios where uh, we had a so called prime gravida with uh, isomerization ict was not done at all and when the baby had uh, significant anemia then we went ahead and did an ict it was positive significant history had not been provided so uh, so in that regard i should say it may be worthwhile to get a booking ict done and then as dr uma said at the next available uh, antenatal visit along with the other prenatal investigations okay so generally uh, how is this test reported the the current way of reporting what is the so so the uh, see the indirect combs test uh, uh, is uh, is one thing which has got very a very poor standardization across the labs which is what causes the trouble and the ict test is reported uh, one as positive or negative that's it and some labs do provide a tighter value also along with it so it is again a good practice if the ict test is given positive to make sure that the lab gives you a tighter value because that gives you some clarity as to the probable significance of the uh, isomerization that has taken place and can give an idea into the uh, uh, chances of the baby developing anemia but that said uh, uh, as i said uh, anemia has been not to be found significantly correlated to that in all the patients a uh, 1 in 4 has been seen with anemia needing transfusion or 1 in 64 has gone on without any significant transfusions at all so it is a rough guide for you to it's a rough guide for us to follow so okay so this lady had an ict um, which was negative and of course we have already answered when we will repeat it i think between any time between 24 28 weeks and the test remains negative 26 to 28 weeks she wants to know about whether she should be having anti d prophylaxis or not her cousin in the usa had it at 28 weeks so uh, uma uh, what is your take on this do you routinely give antenatal anti d prophylaxis my answer may be slightly controversial Does but that's why a panel is uh, <laughs> no so let's i just want us to understand the rationale of this antenatal anti d uh, yeah. it it was introduced in the western world uh, as, at least in the uk in an attempt to reduce the burden of rhesus disease when postnatal despite postnatal anti d being routinely and universally being used there was a, a mild uh, incidence of rhesus disease and this was because of antenatal sensitizing events which we cannot control and therefore this last 1 to 2% reduction in the presence of rhesus disease was achieved by ensuring antenatal anti d was given right yeah. now uh, if we don't so this is across the board now if we don't have a universal postnatal anti d program the leverage that antenatal anti d is going to bring in is not going to be very large and therefore i think we should emphasize appropriate dosing of postnatal anti d ahead of antenatal anti d and if you see the who recommendation they actually say that the antenatal anti d in a low and middle resource uh, setting probably is not something that would uh, you know would be recommended uh, for various reasons including availability etc um having said that in a private practice we do get a lot of people who say so and so has given my cousin has had it with another doctor here or or my cousin has had it elsewhere i usually take the time to talk to them and explain and uh, we do give it we give it for those but i don't routinely give it as a policy to every pregnant woman who is rh negative antenatally we of course give it postnatally but those who are uh, who ask we have a discussion and we give only one dose if you look at the evidence for one dose versus two doses two doses is a this again is on either side of the atlantic as with many other things there is a differences of difference of opinion so the two dose is a very us thing to do a single dose is a uk and european thing to do there isn't that much to be gained by giving two doses of antenatal anti d and uh, you know i therefore if we are giving it we give one dose and that would be at 28 weeks after checking the ict and finding out to be negative 
once you give that antenatal anti d please don't go and test for antibodies again i yeah. think these are the caveats that we have to keep in mind thank you ma because these were all there in my next in my other presentation which i seem to have lost somewhere uh, the important thing is that if you are checking antibodies make sure that this woman has not had a anti d injection with somebody else so that so is important i think what is important is to do, talk to the patient at 28 to 28 weeks tell them about uh, the anti d prophylaxis if the patient is very keen on taking it i think you should uh, give it otherwise you can document and say that uh, it has been discussed regarding anti d prophylaxis tomorrow you should not come and uh, put a case against you because you have not given an anti d so normally we i speak to the patient and tell her that the incidence is much uh, not much different between the postnatal and the antenatal so uh, i either leave it to the patient to take it or not and i mostly most of the time i give it postpartum so i think it is so that we don't proactively promote antenatal prophylaxis but for those who want after yes. explaining we will give it and as uma pointed out cost is definitely a factor so uh, this woman who has been absolutely smooth till now uh, will you induce labor in her will you allow her to go postdated would be the first question um, no i normally don't allow patients to go postdated most of my patients deliver on date or maybe at 39 weeks depending upon the problem other any other problems do you have any concerns about conduct of delivery delivery there is nothing much unnecessary manipulation can be avoided and uh, allow her to get into labor as like any other patient then uh, she particular about delayed cord clamping if she's particular about delayed cord clamping i don't think there's anything wrong though the textbook say early uh, clamping is necessary but i think uh, in a primary gravid or delayed cord clamping doesn't make a big difference what tests would you request for the, on the cord blood direct combs test and uh, hemoglobin of the fetus and our blood grouping So, Omar, the <laughs> policy would you allow to go postdated? Yeah, I mean we don't induce them just because they are Rh negative. Yes, we do allow them to go to uh, you know. And uh, pre-COVID, our policy was to allow women to go postdates and uh, for about you know induce at forty plus five. That was our policy. Or the Rh different. Thing. It wasn't different for Rh negative women. Right. Okay. and the cord clamping again i think there is no uh, the advantage no of cord clamping yeah. is uh, definitely there and if she wants it we need to go ahead so that's uh, fine and this anti d okay now let's forget about antenatal prophylaxis post partum uh, the timing now is that we know we all know about the 72 hours is that an arbitrary 72 hours or is there any rationale behind it oma so i think we need to give the anti d as soon as possible uh, if we uh, at least within 72 hours and it shouldn't take that length of time if we are sending off a cord blood for blood group it should come back to us in 4 to 6 hours and based on that um, we would give the anti d if we miss for some reason we can continue to give it up to 7 days uh, it it's not i mean if we have forgotten if there's an error we have forgotten uh, and the woman gets discharged uh, i mean we should make an effort to ensure that they come back and we can give it up to 7 days but the uh, benefit would definitely be uh, less it will be less but it's better than not giving it at all so ideally we should uh, give it at, as early as possible as early as possible so the 72 hours is is it just a arbitrary time limit is it or has it been shown that beyond that the benefit is very much less because we are giving benefit a... is different yeah yeah right. right okay what about the dose i mean we hear of 300 350 500 uh, is there any difference 350 i have not heard but uh, um, 300 we do give 300 micrograms if we have not given an antenatal uh, prophylaxis at 28 weeks i think 300 micrograms is ideal because it covers yeah, almost age pardon if you have given antenatal uh, anti d would it change the dose no it okay. will not right it will be the same okay so the maximum fetal maternal hemorrhage takes place during delivery 
So to cover up the amount of loss, fetal maternal hemorrhage, I think 300 micrograms would be ideal. Okay, uh, Umar, do you define? I think it's the uh, it's uh, we have to be we have to remember what units we are uh, using when we are talking about the dosing. If you see uh, some of the uh, international guidelines, they go with international units. Yeah, and, they, and therefore the dosing that they mention will be different from what you uh, say when it is micrograms. micrograms. So there is this standard dose that we all use, but we should be aware that when we anticipate that there has been a larger dose of fetal maternal hemorrhage, such as abruption or, or something else, um, ideally uh, we should do a Clayhaw and then calculate what should be the dose that we need to give. Unfortunately, Clayhor is not a test that is easily available in most places. And uh, I mean, almost all the time that we have pushed and sent a Clayhor, we have never got a result that is uh, positive. So uh, I think it's, it seems to be a very simple test to do, but for maybe because it's only the obstetricians who need to drive it and we don't order it often enough for labs to make money out of it, we don't actually have most labs doing it. Therefore, uh, any dose that we want to give over and above the standard dose becomes arbitrary. Hmm. Isn't it? I mean, even if we have twins, for example, in yeah. an RH negative woman, yeah. We really don't know whether we have given an appropriate dosing. And I think that uh, is a challenge that uh, I don't know how we overcome if we don't do a clay home. And uh, is deltoid is generally the choice site, isn't it? So is there any particular reason? Yes, because if you give it in the uh, gluteal, um, most of it gets retained in the subcutaneous tissue. And actual level doesn't come into the blood circulation. That's why deltoid intramuscular, deep intramuscular is advisable. Right. So or you can give it in the anterolateral wall of the thigh. Okay. So this couple is getting discharged. Is there anything in particular that you will tell them? I think we need to have, we would have checked uh, the baby for uh, neonatal jaundice and uh, we need to tell them that there can be a delayed rise in bilirubin, even if the uh, bilirubin is within the normal range at the time of discharge, because that is usually at a 48 hour, 72 hours. So unlike other, you know, where there is no ABO incompatibility or RH incompatibility, we are not so worried about a delayed uh, neonatal uh, ictus setting in. These babies, it may be advisable to recall them and review um, so that we are not seeing a delayed increase in uh, neonatal jaundice. You know, the fact that she has been ready for discharge, that means there is no neonatal jaundice or any ABO incompatibility. Probably it may come a little later. Yeah. So she can be advised to come back after 15 days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there isn't now. But what I am saying uh, is it may go, yeah, no. come on day 5 or day 6. And, uh, okay. and with regard to her RH in particular, would you like to see her before she plans her next pregnancy? Or not particularly? If, she, if the ICT is negative and she has no problem, uh, I don't think there is any need to do any test. She can plan her pregnancy anytime she wants. Right. So we'll move on to the next uh, one. She's a 26-year-old. She's a para-1, previous cesarean at, uh, in 2017 for fetal distress, anti-D given. That pregnancy was absolutely uh, smooth. There was no problem. ICT was negative throughout. Her booking bloods at 8 plus eight weeks, ICT was not done. I think we've already discussed this point about whether we would do it or whether do it later. In her, we would do it. Yeah. In this lady, yes or no? Yes. So in the primary para, it's not of a major thing, but in this lady, you would want to know whether um, she is ICT positive to begin with. Yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. So the dates and scan equal. Her uh, first trimester screening is negative. Anomaly at 20 plus weeks, fine. ICT around 24, 25 weeks, 2 plus. And this is the gel agglutination test which has been used. So uh, now, what is your advice? Um, so if uh, the gel agglutination test is uh, ICT is positive, then we look at the titus. We, we need to do it in dilutions. And then uh, look at the titus. And then depending upon the titus, we need to further advise her what to do next. 
So if the uh, titer is very low and then the fetus is, uh, I mean, the antenatal, uh, the can is fine, then you will ask her to come back after a month and repeat the ICT titers. And uh, if the titer is more than, uh, more than the critical titer, that is most often it is 1 in 16, but in the gel agglutination test, the titers are much higher compared to the tube method, tube agglutination test, which is normally talked about. Um, if the titers are very high, then uh, definitely you need to do the MCA PSV uh, testing. Uh, we'll come to that. At the moment, uh, uh, when will you repeat this test? I mean, are you going to refer the patient now to Sudarshan for a scan? At the if moment? the titers are very low, I would ask her to come back again after the next month. Okay, Sudarshan, would you want to see her now? I would like to refer her. Even, I mean, I would agree that if the titers are low, I'm not too worried. We'll probably repeat it, as Suma said, and get the uh, tighter, you know, strength. Or, uh, but I would at least get an MCA Doppler, assuming that her 20-week MCA Doppler was normal, because I'm sure they'd have done it at Target. So, so the question, what is your take on this? Would you like to see her now, or you're quite comfortable for her? to be referred later? Um, if I see, if I had seen her at the 20th week and at this point of time, the ICT test is positive and uh, the result has come, I would like to see her then and there. Uh, point in note, uh, the worst case scenario case that I just mentioned, this was the exact situation. She had an anomaly scan, 20 weeks normal, MCA was 1.1 mom and at 24 weeks, ICT was 2 plus, MCA was 1.2 mom and she was referred one month later and that baby had high drops and a cranial hemorrhage. So what would I say is uh, if there is very difficult to correlate the ICT uh, 2 plus 3 plus titers and the values with the uh, fetus probably developing anemia. So what I would tell this person is to get a scan check done, get the MCA Doppler, look at the other ultrasound signs of anemia, uh, which, is, which goes beyond the MCA Doppler and make sure that it's been done the right way. And if it's fine, I would keep seeing her every two weeks to monitor the MCA Doppler and the B-mode signs of anemia and plot the MCA Doppler in graphs and uh, see how the trend is. If the trend of the MCA Doppler is showing a rising trend, the MCA mom, then my frequency of follow-up will be earlier. If the trend remains the same for the next few weeks or it starts depressing down, then maybe we can push the follow-up a little wider. Uh, so I would not push them to four weeks later. I would see them then and there and then put her on a two-weekly monitoring at least for the next couple of visits. Okay, while we are still there, if I heard you right, you said apart from the MCA, uh, you would. there are other signs of uh, fetal anemia. Could you just tell us what those are? Yeah. Uh, see, the, the MCA is probably the uh, earliest marker that crops up. If there are other B mode signs of anemia which has come, it means the baby is already severely anemic, which means the hemoglobin must be at least less than five grams for the baby to start having uh, showing signs of cardiac failure. So the anemic baby uh, starts having cardiac failure, so that you can have a slightly enlarged heart, you can have valve regurgitations, you can have fluid collections in the uh, cavities like an ascites or an effusion. And we also see a very large placenta at times, a very thick, large placenta. Uh, uh, Polyhydramnios is seen in very few cases, but more often than not, these are the signs that we see. But with respect to Doppler, the MCA Doppler tends to pick up all these problems uh, before the baby develops all these scenarios. So what is important is that your mind needs to be alert to other factors also. Exactly. The mind needs to be alert to, to have a wholesome view of the baby. It's a very good. That's an excellent point that you brought out. So again, emphasizing the fact that you know the man behind the mission is very important. It's so not. So don't don't think of it as signs of uh, anemia. Rather, look at think of it from the perspective of what does a sick what baby is. have. So in that perspective, start looking at the baby. Then it'll yeah. be easier to pick it up. Okay. So these are the um, moms that we have had: 26, 28, 30, 34, 37 weeks. So yeah. uh, is it anything alarming? Are you worried about any of these values? So this is a brilliant MCA Doppler values. So we'll be very happy and smile at it. Okay, so that's what you did actually for this lady. 
and i think you've answered the other question of any other parameters to follow up so so uh, this is the thing now when would you want to um, sort of uh, go in for a more invasive procedure when would you want to estimate the cord blood hemoglobin so what is the cut off value I, I, i am extremely sorry my other presentation had a more detailed uh, thing but i think now we can take, go along with this yeah so uh, so let, let's take the same patient if i had followed her up at one point of time i had seen the mc as 1.2 the next visit it was 1.4 then that would be put me on a higher alert but i would still try to see the other signs if the baby is otherwise okay at that point of time she would be seen probably more frequently and uh, an mc a cut off of around 1.5 mom is taken for uh, identifying anemia and when you say anemia it is a significant fetal anemia so the mca cut off of 1.5 mom identifies anemia which is significant enough for the baby to start becoming sick which means any hemoglobin of less than around 8 grams 7 to 8 grams yeah. so what we are trying to say is the baby can tolerate around mild to moderate anemia so we try to push the time for the need for intervention by taking the mca peak systolic velocity mom and reach a critical time wherein we say okay if we do not intervene at this point of time the baby is going to become very sick with complications so that cut off limit is the mca psv of 1.5 mom and that is arbitrarily taken as a rule of thumb when you uh, multiply the gestational age of the pregnancy in weeks into 2 that can be the upper limit of the peak systolic velocity say a 24 weeker baby can have an mca psv of maximum around 46 47 if it is about that then it means potentially the baby has anemia but point to note uh, the methodology of making the mca doppler is very very important it is subject to a lot of variations pro pressure uh, angle of the uh, insonation all this can significantly change it so it must be run in the right technique but at times we have seen that there are very variable values so uh, to to answer that question of how will you decide or criteria to diagnose fetal anemia when do you go and do a sampling so if i see an mca psv of 1.5 mom and above and i go and look at other signs of anemia if there is any mild sign or the cut off is above 1.5 then i would straight forward go ahead and plan a transfusion in those scenarios where i see a very variable mca doppler that is say at times i see it as 1.3 mom but i repeat the value again it is coming very very high in those scenarios what i do is i do a fetal blood sampling check the hemoglobin and then plan for a transfusion a day after or else uh, invariably what has stood us in good way is that uh, we plan the fetal blood sampling and transfusion at the same time uh, because we do reduce one invasive test in the baby so 1.5 mom cut off of mca uh, go ahead and plan for the fetal transfusion uh, along with the blood sampling at the same sitting is what i do okay can you tell us, tell us a little bit about the iut itself how much of uh, what do you actually uh, transfuse what how much volume so so, like? so so what we do is we uh, uh, have to get the maternal blood uh, and uh, get o negative blood and we need to cross match it with that to make sure that there are no cross reacting antibodies and once we have noted that we take that o negative blood and then spin it to where uh, we get a uh, we get only the pack cells for the transfusion so we give only component therapy the utility of component therapy is reduces the volume of blood that we need to give the baby instead of giving whole blood so the hematocrit of that pack cells is like a, a, about more than 75 to 80 so we get pack cells which are around 75 to 80 hematocrit from the lab we send it to the unit where it is irradiated uh, the irradiation is primarily done to uh, prevent graft versus host disease reaction it may be rare but we have encountered it in the earlier days when it was not done so it is done as a must for every single one and then we plan the transfusion and uh, with respect to the transfusion we calculate how much volume to transfuse initially we had a graph that graphs calculates uh, the fetal maternal blood volume and uh, the hematocrit of the baby and the hematocrit of the donor blood with that we will be able to get a fair idea of how much volume to transfuse but now there are very uh, simple Uh, uh uh tables available online where uh, you just need to punch in the gestational age 
the donor hematocrit, the fetal hematocrit, automatically the volume gets calculated as to how much of volume will, will you need, need to transfuse. And having so done that, one, that gives the volume of the transfusion. Okay. So what is the follow up? Having done one transfusion, how will you follow yeah. Is it only so having so 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 having done one transfusion, uh, we take the hematocrit of the baby to around forty above forty five percent. That is, we make the hemoglobin of the baby around uh, fifteen sixteen grams, and then keep following them up every week after that. And the hematocrit usually falls by around point eight percent per day, which means if I do a transfusion and take the hematocrit around forty seven percent, and uh, you lead a repeat transfusion in around four weeks. Because in around four weeks' time, from forty-seven percent, it should fall to around twenty-four percent again, which will be eight grams. So the repeat transfusion is planned based on the final hematocrit achieved. If we achieve the final hematocrit of forty-seven percent, then you will need a repeat transfusion as a rule of thumb in around four weeks, because it falls by around point eight percent per day. So we guide the repeat transfusion by the rate of fall of the hematocrit and by the MCA PSV Doppler. We use both to uh, guide the MCA peak systolic velocity, and the indication for the repeat transfusion is what I have just said. Yeah, thank you, thank you. That's very nice. And uh, Uma and Suma, uh, would there be any change in your antenatal care once they have started doing all this for the baby? Would you see her more frequently? Is there anything? If the ICT titers are positive, I think I would see her more often. Uh, maybe every two weeks, depending upon the gestational age. And uh, as she is nearing uh, uh, the third trimester, I would even prefer to see her every week, depending upon the complications she has during her antenatal period. Probably like a UGR or polyhydramnios or something like that. Then you need to see her more often. Timing of delivery depends upon uh, uh, the titers. If uh, she has completed, uh, if the uh, titers are uh, increasing and uh, she has already completed 35 weeks, I would rather induce her and deliver her. um induction of labor is not an option if everything is going on fine you can go on up to term if the titers are not going up and definitely the neonatologist involvement is necessary before i think they should be brief before the patient is being delivered okay so if this patient has had an intrauterine transfusion and you are following her up uh, would you allow her to go up to term no not a, no, i think would yeah. the be happy with you going i think term? No, no. I think there are two situations, uh, Jay Shri. One is what Suma was talking about that there is a titer which is positive, but there is no evidence of fetal anemia in the, yeah. on the scan. Then you can allow her to go, and even there, I you know I would probably uh, you know get her delivered around thirty-eight weeks once we have reached term, because you don't know at what point uh, this is going to affect the baby. There is. the titer means there is some aluminization that has happened but it has not caused fetal anemia uh half, but we have to keep following up so um i would uh, say i would deliver her by 38 weeks but if she has had a transfusion then the timing of delivery is has to be decided in conjunction with the fetal medicine specialist who is actually giving the transfusion because as sudarshan said the uh, they uh, they time that repeat transfusion knowing that it will be a 3 to 4 week period during which time this transfused blood is going to maintain the hemoglobin during that 3 to 4 week period there is going to be a gradual drop in the hemoglobin what the neonatologist will not want is a preterm anemic baby that is certainly going to be more challenging for them to handle if they can have a term baby which is not anemic then they are the happiest so if we can time the last transfusion somewhere around 34 35 weeks then we will be able to go past 36 weeks comfortably and deliver the baby the only difference would be that as you get closer to 34 weeks and you are transfusing because it would usually be the second or third procedure that this woman is having uh there is a risk with every procedure that she may go into preterm labor we tend to steroid at that time because even if she goes into labor then this baby is lungs and you know like the benefit of antenatal steroid is given so that's the only uh additional uh 
intervention that we would do uh, in in somebody who is getting a late third trimester transfusion and uh, in general we have seen that if they are able to transfuse once uh, because sometimes when we get to 33 34 weeks there is this temptation that a 34 weeker will do well in the nicu why should we transfuse once more in utero why can't we deliver and then give a postnatal transfusion but okay. if you do an intra uterine transfusion at that time and then deliver a baby closer to 36 37 weeks then you're giving the neonatologist a baby which is um more mature less anemic and they have the time to decide and they may get away with a single volume exchange transfusion i mean a single uh, transfusion rather than an exchange transfusion so this is certainly a, a conversation that has to happen three ways between the fetal medicine team that is transfusing the obstetrician who is delivering and the neonatal team everybody's comfort level has to be taken on board and then over time you know you know that this is the protocol and you can work seamlessly so i think that is an important point it's a multidisciplinary approach is important you need to talk and units where we are doing more of these i think the protocol would be more easier to in, implement and follow rather than so if we cannot manage them it may be a good idea to refer them to a center where the ultrasound technology is available the neonatology is also available so rather than send uh, you know the mom in a compromised the baby in a compromised state as sudarshan was pointing out some of the patients so the only other thing i i would like to you know practical point of view these couples go all out when they are uh, having their <coughs> intra uterine transfusions they are they need to be prepared that there can be problems for this baby postnatally also and transfusion and other uh, you know i'm sure dr chandra kumar is going to talk about it but therefore the neonatal involvement is important because they have to understand the pros what are the problems that can happen with neonatal care should they be in the hospital once uh, you intra uterine transfusion is done um, generally if they are from out of town maybe sudarshan wants to just take handle that but then, generally if they are from out of town once they have the intra uterine transfusion they are observed overnight in the hospital Yeah. but uh, we don't keep them there after that uh, you know fine so that's more for an observation repeat scan the next day and then discharge probably yes yes yes, yes. yes. because if they travel from far you don't want them to go up and down if they are in the city then it's not an issue i don't know if i'm wrong but some of most of these rh compromised uh, seem to be coming from outstation i think it's a wrong thing to say but is that correct sudarshan yes most of them yes yeah all right um i i did have a few more questions after this about early pregnancy less than 12 weeks less than uh, 20 weeks use of anti d prophylaxis but we are running late so um we will stop with this and because we'll dr chandra kumar has to give us his talk on management of the neonate so can i request um, yeah, i'll just stop sharing thank you very much panelists but uh, we will be getting some questions which we'll take in the end can we have dr chandra kumar's yeah dr chandra kumar is a senior consultant and head at the um, child trust hospital in neonatology and at the mgm healthcare uh, is one of the uh, few dedicated qualified neonatologists i think uh he really has a passion because when you see him handle the babies you know that he's you know he's actually very very fond of them and he wants to give everything that he can so we have dr chandra kumar to talk to us about the management of the neonate in an rh isoimmunization thank you ma'am thank you for the kind introduction uh, and uh, for this opportunity to share my views on rh isoimmunization uh so i mean in the panel discussion and uh, i mean all the uh, antenatal uh, and intranatal issues have been dealt with so 
uh, I mean, uh, as it was discussed elaborately in the uh, disc panel discussion, like, I mean, the management of RHI immunization uh, should start uh, from the very, you know, uh, from the start of pregnancy. I mean, as soon as the pregnancy is confirmed. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Uh, no, we have not. Just give me a minute. It's taking some time. Yeah, I think it's ready. Can you see the slides now? Can I yeah, we can see it now. Slideshow mostly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slideshow it will be better. But yeah, yeah. If there is a problem, we can continue. Fine. Uh, Right. So, I mean, it needs a comprehensive management from uh, uh, early pregnancy till, you know, the planning of delivery. So I would like to uh, present a kind of overview, like what I am going to discuss, because the common scenarios as a neonatologist we see, they usually fall in these uh, four scenarios. The fourth scenario I have divided into A and B. So the first scenario is like you have a, you know, the ICT status in the mother, if available, is no, is negative. Mother is just RH negative. I mean, she is not at ISO immunized and you do not encounter any problem whatsoever. And this baby is considered to be normal at birth. The second scenario is ICT positive, but DCT in the baby is negative and there is no fetal anemia, no high drops. And this baby is also going to be normal. And what we are going to do to this baby? The third scenario will be ICT is positive, DCT is positive. There may or may not be some degree of fetal anemia, but there is no hydrops. And this baby is going to develop jaundice and how we are going to handle this. And the fourth scenario is like there was, I mean, ICT was positive, DCT was positive. There was fetal anemia. Hydrops would have been there in the fetus, but at the time of delivery, hydrops has kind of uh, resolved because of excellent, in, uh, I mean, fetal management. The fourth scenario is the worst scenario where the baby is born with high drops. So let us start with the first scenario. Uh, so here, like uh, the ICT of the uh, pregnant woman is negative. So she usually you uh, come across such scenario in a primary who, uh, you know, who comes with a RH negative uh, blood group and the husband may be RH negative or RH positive. And uh, if she is a multi, I mean, she had had a pregnancy and she was uh, optimally given anti-D in the previous pregnancy and she is not isoimmunized. So when you are uh, 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 seeing a neonate born to such a uh, uh, couple or such a woman, uh, this baby is not at increased risk of anemia. And the jaundice risk for this baby is uh, like any other uh, baby. 
so i mean you don't have to kind of you know do uh, more testing i mean obviously you need to know the blood group of the baby because you need to uh, uh, give antd to the mother if she is uh, planning for next pregnancy but there is no routine uh, cord blood uh, cord dct i mean direct comb test or bilirubin to be done in this baby so you just treat this baby as a normal baby risk assessment for jaundice and follow up for jaundice should be like other normal babies based on the gestation of the baby and postnatal age of the baby and we do follow this american academy of pediatrics or nice guidelines to help us to decide the cut off for uh, treatment uh, of jaundice in this baby so then comes the uh, second scenario where the mother's icd is positive so we know that mother is isoimmunized but there is no fetal anemia i mean here baby's dct is also dct is negative so even though mother's icd is positive some uh, i mean uh, most of the times we do see uh, baby's dct being negative okay it is still a possibility because the mother's titer would have been very low or she would have been isoimmunized very late in the pregnancy that it did not cause much of problem in the fetus here again if the baby's dct is negative the baby is not at increased risk of jaundice and there is no increased risk of anemia but here when the mother's icd is positive we need to get cord blood uh, group of the baby we need to get the total serum bilirubin from the cord blood and we need to get the direct combs test so only then we will know that whether this baby has been um, uh, Ba ba baby is affected or not so if the baby's dct is negative this baby is going to be treated like a baby in scenario 1 if the baby is dct positive then it goes to the next scenario okay so if the baby is dct negative then again the scenario is like the first one you just follow up the baby for jaundice a risk assessment and follow up is as per aap or nice guidelines for a normal baby then comes to the third scenario here mother is icd positive so there may be some mild degree of fetal anemia or no fetal anemia at all here what is important thing which is differentiate from the previous scenario is baby's dct being positive so this babe uh, fetus as a fetus this baby would have been subjected to mca psv monitoring and these psvs would have been less than 1.5 mms so baby did not require any intrauterine transfusion for fetal anemia so this baby is at risk for jaundice and this baby is at risk for anemia so how are we going to handle this so a baby born to a mother who is icd positive and the baby's dct is positive so it means that the antibody has crossed to the baby it has bound to the baby's rbcs and the rbcs will be destroyed so there will be risk of anemia and there will be risk of jaundice so how uh, so request you to please uh, do a slide show okay i mean it has opened in keynote uh, wait 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 you may need to do play play okay yeah is it fine now yeah. yes oh thank you so much uh so right so baby's dct is positive so there is risk of jaundice and anemia so how do we treat the jaundice we follow this aap algorithm or nice guidelines are available we just tend to plot the uh, bilirubin value in this and then we take it accordingly so there are three risk groups the lowermost line represents a baby who is at high risk for uh, you know complications so here because there is already rh isoimmunization you need to tend to um, uh, you look at the gestation of the baby and then you Uh, uh, take the next uh, uh, line uh, down because which means that the baby has a risk factor which is rh isoimmunization for example usually for a 38 weeker who does not have any risk factor we take the uppermost line if that 38 weeker having rh negative pregnancy and dct is positive then we take the middle line similarly for a 35 weeker without any risk factor we take middle line but with rh we take the lowermost line so that the intervention is at the Uh, i mean lower levels of bilirubin 
or if the baby has some neurological complications because of jaundice then we tend to uh, start phototherapy even if the bilirubin levels are less so when we are starting phototherapy what we call is intensive phototherapy uh, so which means that you use optimal uh, cfl or led lights to provide adequate irradiance so we call it as more than 25 microwatt per square centimeter per nanometer that is how that should be the irradiance that is the light available on the surface of the baby to clear the bilirubin okay so it can be uh, two lights from top sometimes we give one light from below also with the help of a billy blanket or a, uh, a phototherapy unit so jaundice because of the available very good phototherapy units with high uh, uh, irradiance that is high intense phototherapy jaundice is often controlled without going for a exchange transfusion so if appropriately detected and treated none of these babies would go in for uh, double volume exchange transfusion of course if referred early uh, to a, a place where you know uh, i mean such facilities are available okay or if the jaundice is picked up early so if well, jaundice can be controlled well with phototherapy but these babies may go on to develop anemia which may require transfusion so these babies have to be followed frequently every 3 4 weeks for anemia because their dct is positive the rbc's are bound to these antibodies and they'll be slowly cleared from the uh, circulation so their pcv tends to uh, drop rapidly and some sometimes they may just uh, you know uh, present to you with anemia and the features of um, failure anemia with failure so these babies have to be instructed at the time of discharge that they should come frequently every 3 4 weeks for follow up and uh, we need to check the pcv and hemoglobin of the baby there is a dubious role for ivig also if the and uh, uh, jaundice is controlled well uh, by phototherapy but if the baby is requiring repeated transfusion there could be a role for ivig because ivig is believed to uh, halt this process of hemolysis which is happening even though we don't have enough evidence for this if you appropriately manage the initial part of jaundice then there is probably no role for ivig just for the sake of uh, you know uh, preventing uh, anemia or multiple transfusion then come we come to the worst scenario that is scenario 4 so scenario 4 is you have icd positive dct positive and there is evidence of fetal anemia and this is what probably dr sudarshan this graph uh, uh, dr sudarshan was kind of referring to where uh, they monitor the mca peak uh, systolic velocity uh, based on the gestation of the baby and they would see where this mca psv of the candidate fetus is tracking Uh, which line it is following so if the mca psv of this uh, particular fetus drops to the right of this dotted line then the risk for um, uh, anemia is very very less uh, even if it is there it is going to be a mild anemia and the baby is not going to require any iut but if the uh, uh, mca psv falls on the left of this dark line then this fetus is at risk of uh, severe and moderate anemia there is high risk of developing high drops in this baby so to prevent uh, risk of developing high drops uh, this baby require uh, repeated intrauterine transfusion or if they had already uh, features of high drops obviously this baby would require iut to reverse the uh features of hydrops okay so both scenario can happen so if picked up early uh, before even before the hydrops develops the iuts would develop uh, would help prevent the uh, the fetus developing hydrops if the baby had had already hydrops features of course these iuts will uh, you know revert those hydropic changes so let us come to the scenario 4a where is icd positive uh, there is fetal anemia but there is no hydrops so when this baby is born so what is the time of delivery timing of delivery it depends on uh, i mean uh, as uh, discussed earlier in the panel we need to discuss that uh, along with the obstetrician so if there are any other obstetric complication which would demand a delivery of the fetus we need to take them into consideration we need to discuss with the fetal medicine uh, specialist about the timing of the delivery the feasibility of going for uh, you know one more intrauterine transfusion 
and as a neonatologist we always want the baby to be at least 34 weeks plus and uh, i mean that also depends on whether the baby's hydrops is under control or the baby is still you know kind of hydropic where probably you can give the benefit of one more transmission uh, transfusion to the baby and uh, pull the pregnancy for couple of weeks more so that the hydropic features uh, you know kind of you know uh, uh, resolve or kind of uh, control to some extent so if these uh, this baby does not have features of hydrops and there is there was fetal anemia and this baby has been adequately treated with intrauterine transfusion Uh, so we do not face much of problem in uh, managing this baby so if baby could have, could be a late preterm baby born at around 34 to 37 weeks of gestation so we do have some problems related to this late prematurity but if uh, this baby had been provided steroids i mean respiratory distress may not be much of a problem Uh, usually they do not require any uh, surfactant therapy or ventilation i mean with cpap or minimal supportive care their respiratory and hemodynamics are taken care of so the common issues which we face again in these babies are like scenario 3 we do face jaundice in these babies so we need to be prepared uh, for uh, uh, i mean phototherapy double volume exchange plus or minus may or may not be required anemia is a problem in this baby and these babies do require frequent follow up and the one more important thing we commonly see in such babies who have received 3 4 intrauterine transfusion is cholestasis so when this uh, uh, indirect jaundice part resolves uh, with phototherapy the direct component of jaundice starts uh, increasing uh so we can uh, we also see what is called as you know bronze baby syndrome in this babies after they receive phototherapy because of direct hyperbilirubinemia because they tend to have uh, they are at high risk of developing uh, direct jaundice because of cholestasis so why cholestasis in this babies because there is hemolysis there is repeated iuts there will be lot of bilirubin which is formed and there is increased biliary sludging so this blood sludge causes Uh, cholestasis and this will lead to what is called as uh, bronze baby syndrome in the baby so we need to identify this and we need to stop phototherapy if the direct bilirubin component is significant so this cholestasis improves with enteral feeding sometimes we do give a course of phenobarbital in these babies and some of them also may require uh, cholerytics like uh, ursodeoxy cholic acid so then comes the uh, 4b sorry for that um, uh, 4b scenario where icd is positive there is fetal anemia the baby has received iut but still still there are features of hydrops in this baby so this may be a kind of baby you know who presented to uh, dr sudarshan very late uh, so uh, intrauterine transfusion was given but you know there was no adequate you know uh, interval was not there there is some maternal risk or uh, obstetric uh, complications or some fetal risk so the baby had to be delivered even before uh, the hydropic features could kind of revert so this is the severest form which is rare nowadays if you identify or its isomenization early in pregnancy or fetal anemia early in pregnancy and appropriately treated so these babies we fit tend to face all sort of complications so it is a multidisciplinary management in fact we need uh, you know lot of support from the neonatal side so the few problems which we face in these babies are rds definitely it is a problem because a, a baby who is hydropic the surfactant does not work well so the lungs are immature even though gestationally they may be closer to 34 weeks shock is a problem because the myocardium is compromised anemic it, there is cardiomegaly there may be pericardial effusion so there is cardiogenic shock and distributic shock because their vasomotor tone is very less because of anemia so there will be leaking out there will be hypovolemia uh, albuminemia hypovolemia uh, Uh, so all these things would cause a shock i mean managing shock could be a problem in this baby they may have pleural effusions peritoneal effusions so all these things will cause problem to us and then obviously the jaundice and anemia are going to be uh, problematic so these babies should be delivered in a hospital where there is level 3 neonatal care available lot of anticipation and planning is required and a team of neonatologists should attend the delivery i mean one neonatologist is not 
uh, adequate to resuscitate such babies so delivery room management has to be you know the team has to uh, brief about the you know what they are going to anticipate and do in the delivery room uh, uh, room so the individual persons have to be assigned role to take care of because one may be required to do a peri uh, peri uh, uh, peritoneal uh, uh, peritoneal synthesis one may require uh, uh, one may have to do thoracic synthesis one may have to intubate the baby so all these three things may have to be started simultaneously and these babies may require umbilical venous catheterization in the labor room itself so all these things have to be planned uh, depending on the sickness level of the baby so two to three, three trained personnel will be required if hydrops is suspected so you have to be prepared for abdominal synthesis thora thoracosynthesis so we may have to sometimes do what is called as partial exchange transfusion within the uh, labor room itself partial exchange is done uh, uh, to improve the hematocrit of the baby if the hematocrit of the baby is less than 30 or 35 then this baby will be severely hypoxic and maybe may not be uh, may not respond to the resuscitation also so there to just improve their pcv to an acceptable level of 30 35 we do what is called as partial exchange transfusion and it may be required within the labor room itself okay so we need to have one negative prbc ready for uh, that also if the baby is severely hydrophobic and then the baby will be resuscitated as per our nrp algorithm so if the baby is you know asphyxiated depressed and the baby will not uh, i mean delayed cord clamping may not be possible but otherwise delayed cord clamping can be done in other scenarios uh, which we had uh, discussed earlier because uh, delay uh, i mean theoretically uh, people tend to believe that uh, you know delaying the cord clamping would transfer more antibodies um, and may cause problem and all that but it is not so so recent studies have shown that you know even in these babies um, the pcv remains high if you practice delayed cord clamping and there is no increased risk of jaundice increased risk of exchange transfusion or phototherapy if you practice delayed cord clamping in our choice organized uh, fetus uh, babies but if there is high drops probably we 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 should not do it so we need to have at least if you are uh, expecting an hydropic infant we need to have o negative prbcs at least two units uh, cross matched with mother sample should be available uh, uh, even before the delivery uh, so as soon as the baby is born we need to collect the cord blood sample uh, for grouping dct we need to do a pcv total serum bilirubin and uh, of course cross matching sample also should be uh, collected so provide appropriate respiratory and hemodynamic support let us not dwell into the detail of those things so i mean uh, we need to start with iv fluids in the baby we need to start this baby on intensive phototherapy immediately and uh, we need to be uh, 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 decide based on the cord blood bilirubin and pcv levels so as i uh, discussed earlier the partial Uh, exchange transfusion is done to improve the hemoglobin status if the baby is severely anemic because this baby when you subject them directly to double volume exchange transfusion because of the anemia which the baby already has may not tolerate the double volume exchange procedure and may collapse so that's why we do what is called as partial exchange transfusion so it is done to improve the hemoglobin status of the baby and it is indicated if the pcv of the baby cord blood pcv is less than 35 at birth Uh, it is also done in baby who is hemodynamically unstable and hy hydrophobic okay so to improve the hemoglobin status so double volume exchange transfusion is done if the baby's bilirubin is more than 5 or pcv is less than 30 so dvt is used to is done to decrease the bilirubin burden in the baby so partial exchange is done to improve the hemoglobin status double volume exchange is done to decrease the bilirubin burden and to remove the sensitized rbcs from the circulation so in partial exchange what we do is we just use 50 ml per kg of o negative prbcs um, we just remove the um, uh, uh, volume uh, that 50 ml per kg blood volume from the baby and put this uh, prbcs to improve the hemoglobin status in double volume exchange transfusion we usually uh, do the double the volume of 
the expected blood volume of that baby. So the indications for DVET include high drops, cord HP less than 10 or PCV less than 30 or cord bilirubin more than 5 milligram per dm. Or if the baby's bilirubin falls in the double volume exchange zone as per American Academy of Pediatrics charts for 35 and above weeks gestation or below 35 weeks, we follow some, some other chart called Maisel chart. So we can also follow NICE guidelines. There are some other indications despite phototherapy, if the bilirubin rises more than one milligram per DL or more than 0.5 milligram per DL per hour despite phototherapy, or if the uh, bilirubin rises more than 12 milligram in the first 12 hours. So these are all other indications, but we nowadays we tend to follow the uh, track the bilirubin on the AAP or MIS, uh, AAP chart. Okay. So if the baby has any neurological signs, then yes, early exchange has to be done. So the procedure, I don't want to go into the detail. The volume of blood, as I told earlier, it is double the blood volume of the baby. It is 80 ml per kg for a term baby and 90 to 100 ml per kg for a preterm baby. So we usually uh, uh, do through the UVC. Uh, sometimes in a baby who is hemodynamically compromised, severely hydropic, we also do what is called as isovolumetric exchange where we catheterize both UVC, I mean umbilical vein and umbilical artery. One person withdraws from umbilical artery uh, blood, the other person puts in blood through the umbilical vein. This is called as isovolumetric exchange because uh, uh, you don't want to compromise the baby because of severe high drops. The baby is in hemodynamic compromise. So you want to uh, just as you withdraw the blood, you pu push the blood in also. <laughs> So that will reduce the hemodynamic compromise in the baby. So the blood we use is ABO compatible RH negative. If the baby had had received intrauterine transfusion, obviously the baby is going to be O negative. So we use O negative PRBCs. If the baby did not have uh, any uh, intrauterine transfusion and the baby requires for high bilirubin levels, then we go with ABO uh, group of the baby and it should be RH negative blood. So we prefer to use packed red blood cells cross-matched with maternal serum and it should be irradiated RBCs to prevent graft versus host disease in the newborn. And it should be packed cell and whole blood is not uh, preferred. So this table just summarizes what are the you know, uh, uh, choice of blood. I mean, I would not go into the detail. So we use PRBC than whole blood because the risk of, you know, uh, transfusion associated reactions are less with component therapy. So the, of course, this uh, procedure itself is, you know, uh, because more and more better phototherapy machines are available. People are, uh, you know, less uh, uh, experienced in double volume exchange. So we need to be very careful. We need to do it in a center where, uh, you know, the people have experience. Uh, especially, you know, uh, in a hydropic infant. Okay, this baby may require even isovolumetric exchange transfusion. The so risk related, uh, the mortality related to the procedure itself is 0.5 to 2 percent, and then the other uh, disturbances can happen: hyperkalemia, hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia. So this NEC is common in these babies, and other transfusion reaction and transfusion associated. Uh, cardiopulmonary overload, all those things can happen. So we uh, track the bilirubin and these, some of these babies may require one or two more double volume exchanges also. So there are, there are other options like IVIG, albumin, phenobarbitone, metalloporphyrin, all these things uh, I know kind of to manage the jaundice part. IVIG, as I told, I mean, does not, uh, th there is not much of evidence to support it, uh, the use of IVIG, but we do individualize and give in some babies, especially when there is a rapid rise of bilirubin and when you find blood is not available for, you know, exchange transfusion and you want to buy time, you want uh, bilirubin not to be rising so that it could cross blood brain barrier and cause permanent neurological damage in the uh, baby. So in such cases, we do give IVIG, but it should be reserved and we do not have any, I mean, uh, evidence uh, that it reduces the need for exchange or reduces the need for phototherapy or reduces the need for uh, further PRBC transfusion in future. So use of IVIG should be restricted. 
Albumin infusion, people have thought that it would bind to unconjugated bilirubin and therefore uh, will reduce the amount of bilirubin, load of bilirubin, which could cross blood-brain barrier. But st again, it is not being used commonly. Hydration is probably not an option in a baby who is hydropic. But if you are uh, treating a baby who is you know, not hydropic, but has high bilirubin levels, it is an option. We do exercise. Phenobarbitone is not going to help immediately the effect of phenobarbitone comes later especially it is useful for treating the cholestasis part of uh, 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 jaundice than uh, the indirect hyperbilirubinemia in these babies so other uh, things are very experimental and we don't be we won't be using often metalloporphyrin zinc or clofer because with efficient phototherapy units available we don't resort to other modes uh, nowadays so these babies need follow up uh, uh, because the risk of neurodevelopmental impairment is there so they need to be followed up hearing impairment is common audio uh, i mean um, uh, auditory asynchrony or dyssynchrony we call so here i mean hearing screening vera assessment is required and late onset anemia as i discussed earlier needs uh, frequent follow up so to summarize uh, these are all the scenarios so the management uh, part of uh, scenario one would be just to give anti-D to the mother if she wants uh, one more pregnancy. So scenario two where the mother is ICT positive, no anti-D is required because she is already um, isoimmunized, but she should be sensitized that if she is planning to have one more pregnancy, then uh, I mean she should be uh, following up with the obstetrician in time and uh, she need to undergo um, repeated scans to assess the risk of fetal anemia. Uh, scenario 3 where ICT and DZT are positive, fetal anemia is there but there is no high drops and fetal anemia is mild. Uh, uh, my, our, there may not be anemia but here the risk of jaundice is there so baby may require phototherapy plus or minus PRBC transfusion. 4A well managed baby, hydrops is under control, no hydrops at birth. With phototherapy, we can manage. Sometimes they may require PRBC transfusion. 4B is a hydropic infant which needs double volume exchange, phototherapy and other supportive measures including ventilation and other hemodynamic support. So, so it is a preventable disease and appropriate antenatal monitoring and fetal management is important. Perinatal team has to be prepared to manage uh, uh, this baby. Of course, DVET and intensive phototherapy with adequate supportive care can save these babies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chandrakumar, for that detailed uh, run through of the neonatal management. Uh, yes, we are running short of time, but there are a few questions if the faculty don't mind, if we can just take it. A uh, quick question to Dr. Sudarshan. How many fetal medicine units are available throughout Tamil Nadu where IUT can be done? Uh, very difficult question to answer. I actually do not know the answer to this question. Not to worry. <laughs> 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 um, but, but we do have very good centers. Yeah, there are centers. Yeah, that's, yeah. That is what is important. Yeah. Uh, how often we need to repeat MCA Doppler when a patient has had an intrauterine transfusion? So uh, what we follow, see, it, it, it depends upon the unit protocols. What protocol do I do follow is in a very sick hydropic infant after the transfusion, uh, I ask them to follow up with the, not only the Dopplers, but also the scan to look at how the baby is recovering. I would say every week, because uh, though we do expect that uh, the fetuses, uh, hematocrit drops at 1% per day, there are that fetuses which are rapid hemolyzers. And uh, they do tend to become little sicker, uh, especially those that have a high uh, volume load of the antibodies. So weekly follow up after the transfusion is what I advise them initially. Right. And the other question is, uh, is there a transfusing of adult HbA to the fetus, which has HbF being more affinity to oxygen? Does it have any correlation? Well, no, that, that doesn't change much. There have been studies which have also shown okay. that that there is no significant change uh, in the uh, uh, in, in in the baby at all between transfusing adult blood. Yeah, no. Okay. Then is there a difference in the strength of anti D between the single and two dose regimens? Do we need to give a higher dose if it's single? Uma, no. Uma. 
no no it's just the same dose single dose uh, and as i said uh, a single dose of antenatal antid is as effective as a double dose there's no need to give two doses okay i i have one question to dr chandra kumar if i may yeah 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 sir uh, there have been some of uh, the post transfused babies where uh, in, in in the in the immediate neonatal period they've had some paxil transfusion exchange transfusions and then the babies have come back after 8 weeks 9 weeks with again anemia yeah. okay and uh, you did mention that in your talk also that they need to have a closer monitoring initially uh, because the antibodies can be there in the fetal in in the baby's blood we can still break it down uh, what do you do for these recalcitrant anemias my question is if you keep on transfusing and the baby would that suppress the bone marrow of the baby and prevent it from actually producing new blood uh, what is the threshold do you use to say okay only if it goes below this i would go and transfuse the baby again yes so that's why we are very restrictive in transfusion because we uh, uh, there is in addition to hemolysis which is happening because of isoimmunization these babies do have bone marrow suppression okay so what we do is if the baby is otherwise growing well so we transfuse these babies only if the hemoglobin is less than 7 and we do follow them up until 3 months okay so usually this is the timeline when the bone marrow starts recovering and the anemia kind of you know starts improving on its own so till 3 months of age every 3 to 4 weeks they need to come and check their hemoglobin and pcv checked and after 3 months the bone marrow recovers and then you know usually they do not require transfusion so in these babies uh, if there is significantly depressed hemoglobin mm. you 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 tend to see a very high retic count is that how it is what is the no see when there is bone marrow yes, suppression, suppression so retic count will not be high no. retic count will not be high so retic count will uh, usually that is the scenario in babies who were hydropic and who had received lot of transfusion in utero if the babies did not have hydrops uh, but baby was you know isoimmunized and dct is positive and the baby is having jaundice and just anemia they will have high retic count these babies usually do not have anemia which continues to persist till 3 months of age they may require just a one transfusion or they may not require transfusion also only jaundice may be the main problem in these babies so is there anything where you because of the bone marrow suppression you had to try give them erythropoietin so there are you know people you know uh, uh, i mean if you look at you know studies i mean there are not much of uh, studies on this aspect like rh induced bone marrow suppression people have not tried uh, erythropoietin because one for the reason we know that you know it is uh, kind of it is going to spontaneously resolve uh, after a uh, few months so i mean usually by the by 3 months or so it spontaneously improves so that is the one thing and also it is also based on the experience from preterm babies so in preterm babies for anemia of prematurity people have used erythropoietin and there is you know slightly increased risk of retinopathy in these babies so that may be one reason why people do not want to try erythropoietin as an option in this group of babies so i think the next question is is there any role for a direct coombs test for the mother No. In the what? context of RH uh, isoimmunization for the baby, no. No. Right. Then the other question I think which comes up very often, and we have asked people have asked us is, uh, my mother was B negative, has had four vaginal deliveries with no fetal or maternal complications, <laughs> did not receive <laughs> anti D for any of her deliveries. All the children and father are RH positive, doing well, including me. that's dr nikita <laughs> was given this question she was very healthy till 90 years and we came to know about her group when she was hospitalized for cardiac evaluation at 86 how do you account for this i mean i have had i any mean, all of us have i think uh, had patients who have come with this yes so how do we explain this can the experts tell me 
So it's like, I mean, you know, I have, I walked out without mask and I did not get uh, COVID. COVID. (laughs) I think uh, she's, she did not mount an immune response to that RH positive cell. That's the only one. Why did she not mount? There are some reasons. I I, I think uh, as a neonatologist, we are, we are, uh, you know, asked uh, when we were students, we were asked like, even if there is RH, why the baby is not, mother is not ISO immunized. One thing is that the RH antigen is not very much well expressed on the surface of fetal RBCs. So even if the baby is positive, it may not always cause isoimmunization, sensitize, or there may be concurrent ABO incompatibility in the baby. Like mother may be O, baby may be ARB. So when this RBC crosses the blood, mother has anti-A and anti-B already in the circulation. So the uh, these RBCs are destroyed immediately. So this arch system is not sensitized because the, the fetal antigens do not have enough time to be in the circulation of the mother to sensitize the mother. So these are all some of the reasons where, you know, despite the babies being positive, the mother is not uh, isoimmunized. Next is a very interesting question. Can a rhesus incompatible mother in the first pregnancy become a surrogate mother in the future? Think so. She can. Depends. If the, if the only concern is that uh, if she, if she's rhesus negative mm-hmm. and the embryo, I mean, the f- developing fetus can be rhesus positive, then the couple must be made aware that uh, there can be a aluminization and all the risks that go with it, including the need for IUT, etc. So, uh, already if somebody is going through surrogacy, I think they would not want to take not somebody want to do it. on board. But if it's an RH negative couple, I think then uh, it's not an issue. So, I we mean, need to, yeah. so it just being on. sensible. Yeah. Okay, the next question uh, to Dr. Hegde. Uh, can Dr. Hegde talk about a weak D report? This was a lady who had been told she's RH negative. When blood grouping was done at booking, she was reported as weak D positive. She yes. then underwent a full RH antibody screening that came back as negative for antibodies. Yes. Uh, so weak Ds, if we look at this concept of weak D, there are two types of weak Ds which we can think of. The weak D, uh, which is due to lesser antigenic expression. Uh, this type of weak Ds do no harm. Just by transfusing um, uh, negative blood uh, to the um, uh, baby, it, it's okay. There is no problem at all. And uh, they do not get sensitized also. So this is not a question. So, but the question arises when there is a partial D. Partial D is a D where there is loss of epitopes on the D antigen surface. So what happens is when we test them, they appear to be a negative uh, D, but they have the ability to sensitize. So that being the case, now the question arises whether to give uh, anti-D prophylaxis when the case is of a partial D. This question arises as BCHS guideline says that it has to be given. Whether it is partial D or a weak D, it has to be given. So this is the question. So how do you distinguish whether it's a weak D or a partial D? Distinguishing is actual, actually it needs a wide range of anti-D, anti-sera or the, the, at least two types of anti-D should be used to test the weak D. So, in case one misses, the other one gives. So, that uh, is an indication where uh, these anti- weak Ds has to be tested with two anti sera. But still, there are chances that the second one also may miss. So, uh, th- this is a trial and error based uh, uh, rule where we can definitely can't exactly say that this is a partial D and this is a weak D. If both the anti sera gives a very weak mild reaction, then it is a weak D which is not a partial D. That is for sure. But if one anti sera gives reaction with the uh, cells and one does not give, it is a case for partial entity. 
So, so uh, pra- in a practical sense, if this woman requires blood, is mm. it safer to give her Rh negative blood Rh or Rh negative? Rh negative, negative can be. Blood. And we would immunize her after she delivers if the baby is Rh positive. So, for all practical purposes, we treat her as Rh negative. Yes, Rh negative. A couple of quick questions. Thank you, Dr. Vikas. Does induction increase chances of immunization? No. No. That compared to uh, leaving her postdated, it no. does not. Then recurrent abortions. Patient has not received anti-D at all. Planning pregnancy now. How would you counsel her? So it depends on the uh, timing of the miscarriage. Because if you actually look at the RCOG guidance. If you have a complete spontaneous miscarriage you before don't. 12 weeks, actually the recommendation is you need not give anti-D. Yeah. However, if it is a uh, induced termination of pregnancy, by that they mean that if there is a very small or absent fetal pole or a very early uh, fetal heart cessation, it's unlikely that there is going to be a triggering of the immune system. So in those kind of early recurrent miscarriages, it's unlikely that she would have had, but it would be, be safe um, or good practice to check her anti-D titer. Before uh, she comes to you before. Yeah, before or when she books. So you need not worry if she doesn't have, uh, you know, if her ICT is negative, you don't have to worry. Last question is for an ectopic pregnancy, do you give anti-T? Yes. yes. Yeah, I think that was the few slides in the end which were missed out in my presentation, yeah. which we would have actually supported. I think we have gone well beyond time, but it's been a wonderful uh, program. So I'd like to thank Dr. Vikas, uh, Dr. Chandra Kumar, Uma, Suma, and Sudarshan for all you know the lovely participation from all of you and um, the support team as well as um, Mr. Session and team from Science Integra for helping us put up this program. Uh, thank you very much. Is there anything in particular any of you want to say? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. You. Thank you all. I think, yeah. Thank you. Stay safe. I think take care of yourselves. That's important. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>